So here we go. Blink and you'll miss it because we're sped up three times here and then we'll go to four times the speed. Um, but uh, yeah, again, we're just I'm just posing it here so I don't know how, how riveting this is going to be in, in real time. Um, but it's super important for um, you know, when you're actually doing it. And what you'll notice is that I'm constantly going back. Like, like, look, this head, I drop down, right? I just, and then I'm, I'm hitting an angle in the neck as well. And the point when I finish it, it's nowhere near as extreme as it, as it should be. So I keep on going back to it. That's, you know, I was mentioning in an earlier video about this idea of alla prima, like your first mark being your, your final one. And it's, it's something that I'm still just, just trying to work for myself. And, um, but I, I really recommend that you try and push it for yourself as well, because the rotation of that head is like, what 10 degrees off or maybe five degrees or something either way and an unacceptable amount to be off especially because um the the head angling down is um is a key part of the pose right this is a, a horse that is scared and is is startling and is is rearing up so it lowering its head is is kind of part of that um so yeah if you undercook that then well that's i don't know it's just really bad <laughs> um so similar thing here like I mean, on the back leg, we've got a lot of angles to, to play with because, yeah, the femur, tibia, um, uh, well, tibia and fibula, and the foot, and then the toes, they all hit slightly different angles. So when you're looking at something like that, go for the big angle first, right? So the, the back of the hips, the ischium, uh, that's the furthest out point there. Go from there to the toe and, and see if that angle is correct to start with, and then try and get the, the angles on the inside to work. Um, now, in this case, what we're doing is we are um, taking a horse with one set of proportions and being inspired by a pose that has a second set of proportions. This is a very dangerous area, but it, and it's a very important area that you learn how to navigate because maybe you're doing an expression on a specific um, face or like uh, something that you've designed yourself and then you're using reference from a different face. Um, well, you need to know how, how do you take the ideas from that and, and inter you know, allow them to be interpreted on your, on your sculpt um, without taking the uh, specific characteristics that you don't want because if you do that you'll end up being off model and maybe that sounds obvious but like honestly you'll, it's a trap you'll fall into like I find myself um, falling into it in this demonstration because this um, there we go finally going back to the head and trying to hit that angle and I still don't think it's enough you know anyway um, yeah I find myself here because the the reference is of a horse that is so stocky and meaty and the proportions are so much um, more compact that I you know I sort of like um, well you know I really enjoy that sort of movement and, and it's more my style right when when things are shorter the the movements are much more dynamic they move in a much quicker and more exciting way when things are longer the movements get stretched out think about like a piece of string that you push together and you pull out um, and uh, and the, the movements become longer and more elegant that's why like in fashion drawings a figure might be eight or nine heads high to really stretch them out you know they'll still be super thin so then the movements are very very elegant um, but but yeah less uh, less dynamics it's a different sort of feel and so what we're doing here is we're using a reference of a of a horse that's got those short dynamic movements and trying to translate those onto onto a horse that has got these longer more elegant movements something to be you know really aware of So I was posing this this um, this right leg. I didn't realize initially that that's actually not on the floor. So that's an interesting um, dynamic in the pose, and it's something that you see in quadrupeds when they when they walk as well. Is the kind of mirroring of the right back leg and the front left leg, and and vice versa. So here, his front left leg is raised, and his right back leg is uh, is also raised, albeit only a small amount. So then, then the weight is kind of in this pose distributed diagonally across the body right it's being held on the front right leg and the back left leg because you think if that was all on one side that's a much more difficult uh, way to hold the weight so you distribute it diagonally and it spreads it across so it was just a little thing that got reinforced to me in, in doing this and like I mean this is just a great thing with like with every project that you do as long as your mindset is is as long as you're intentionally trying to go okay what lessons can I learn from this what what can I do to push myself forwards like every project levels you up in some way, but be but be um, 
willing to engage with that actively look for it like whatever project it is you're doing even if it's just like a homework assignment for this and you don't have much time to spend on it and yada 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 well just go okay in what way can i level up here and let's say let's say you're doing a human sculpt and you've already done a human sculpt because you did the anatomy course with me or whatever it is right well when you're doing it again what area can you break through that you haven't broken through before is that understanding the pose a little bit more is it some textural quality is it losing and finding your lines a little bit more is it a specific feel that you want to get or maybe or maybe you're interested in in stylization and you want to try and capture that that style and not only capture it but also internalize it and have it part of your part of your visual library moving forward it's part of your dna as as an artist well be clear about what your goals are and and then um and then by the end of it assess whether or not you've managed to hit that you know don't don't do these projects mindlessly there, there are of course going to be gains to doing it because you put time in and, and you'll get benefit from it but there are smart ways of doing it and, and less smart ways of doing it so as i'm looking for this pose like you see here i'm just going and hitting the bones and just making sure they're all appropriately sharp uh, it's, it's something that you want to be very mindful of when you when you pose the the character is any areas that you've moved like how have they adapted what's what things are getting strengthened up what things are getting weakened uh, what things are getting sharpened what things are getting softened and really capture that so as soon as you like let that front left left limb you know it's, it's bent at such a strong angle so you're going to get real areas of extension that's around the front where the, you know you really want to capture the feeling of the bones and then areas of compression at the back but there's no fat to compress there on a on a horse hand right essentially or a horse foot uh, but there might be wrinkles, you might be able to capture little wrinkles or something like that. Just as soon as you pose a thing, where is the weight being carried? Where is the compression? Where is the extension? Where is the tension? And, you know, how do you how do you push that? Um, and it, it's not like I don't think that you need that much to 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 tell the story. And it's going to make your your sculpt just look a, a thousand times better. So, yeah, really worth exploring, I think. So yeah, every mark that I'm doing here, like, hopefully is not fixing anything that was wrong in the underlying sculpt, which there will probably inevitably be an element of that because, you know, putting it in the pose is going to give you a fresh eye. But ideally, every every decision that I make now, every brushstroke that I make is kind of going, okay, what what can I do to make it work for this pose? And there, there are times there where I get a little bit blindsided because, you know, I'm looking closely at, at Barry's work and I'm going... Uh, okay, what did he do? How did he capture this muscular mass? And that's, you know, that's a really useful thing to do because because um, then you're learning how a master artist interpreted uh, interpreted the form, interpreted the anatomy. It's a slightly different thing to to go into nature yourself. I, I think you need to do both. You know, go to nature yourself and go. Okay, what are you? <laughs> what are you? And how do I, how do I capture you? Where is where is the order? Where is the chaos? and how do I capture the balance between those and then look at artists you admire whether they're living or dead whatever it is and go okay you how did you capture it you know so again you're doing your study but you're doing your study in a mindful way you're not just switching off and copying shapes you're going well I mean in order to be, to be able to do that you need to have an understanding of the forms yourself and then you can go okay Rubens Michelangelo Barry Sheila whatever it is how how are you interpreting that and you know, here I'm just putting in the, the tail. And the interesting thing about doing hair sculpturally is it has to be pure design because because you, you cannot even come close to representing it as it is, which is, you know, however many thousand separate hairs. Um, and uh, and so I think, well, yeah, there I was just lazy, you know, blocked in something for the tail and then took the, the hair from his bum and stuck it on his head, which, um, which is quite a popular operation nowadays. You know, British footballer Wayne Rooney was famous for having that to, to cure his baldness stick the, the bomb hair on the head so um so our old man in his transition to a brave and noble horse has had the same operation anyway um so yeah as, you, as you're dealing with hair you need to go okay how do i represent you without even being able to come close to describing what you are that's you know we were speaking in another video about caricature and it's essentially that it's like what is your quality Right, what, what is the thing that makes you you, right? And when I say you, I'm talking to the hair, of course. Um, and uh, and the way that you do it will will be different to the way anyone else does it because it's like I say, it's it's pure design. Um, but uh, 
but yeah if you're struggling and if you're doing it and you're like ah, it's just it's not working then then that can be useful to go to an artist that where you go okay the hair is working on that uh on that figure on that character whatever it is and then go okay what what was it that you did to make it work and then you know and then take that and and the thing is is like you can't avoid it being filtered through you it's only it's always going to have your style as a uh as a part of it you can't escape that so you don't really need to worry about not developing your own style that's going to naturally come because you're your own person and you're not and you're not anyone else um so so yeah you you can be quite brave with just stealing to steal internalize and then uh and then yeah you don't need to to think about what you would do to make it change that that'll that stuff will come um it was a big beat that I missed on the ears, but it is really important to the pose, right? Having those ears really rotated back. And, um, yeah, and what was interesting is like, well, in, in general anyway, looking at Barry's version of the sculpt, because I also had the sculpt on my desk, so I didn't have to have the, the um, you know, the low quality scan with me the whole time. And just looking at seeing how, how he represented the form. And it was all pretty like primitive in terms of the marks were all very choppy and things like that, but just like, you can see like every time he just puts his puts his tool to the clay uh he's doing it with an intention to convey this muscular mass which has this amount of tension or is stretched this amount so that was really interesting to to take and uh so yeah as we're working on the head like yeah the shapes of the mouths i hadn't really thought of that it's like he shaped the mouth in quite a human way i've got no idea whether a horse um actually forms that same kind of look of dismay in its mouth i'm sure it has a way of doing it um I don't know if it's that, but you know, so that's something that I would need to go and look into. But that's what, that's what Barry says, and potentially, it doesn't. Potentially, he just found that people will read that um, because it's a bit of uh, what would you say anthropomorphism, right? Where it's like you take a bit of the human quality and put it in there. And he, like for example, he, the the eyes on his sculpture bulge about, I don't know, a hundred to a thousand times more than more than my eyes bulge. Uh, because part of the, the, the sculpt, if you're looking at the sculpt holistically, right, you're not just going, like, like the way that I've built it is fine for demonstration, but it's kind of impure, right? When you, when you build something in a, in a T pose and then you pose it, it's, it's like th this idea of every decision being made to contribute to the story in the pose can't be the case because you've already made 100,000 decisions when you sculpted it in that in that one pose and then you're posing it so you kind of have to fight against the the natural uh blandness that you get in there as, as a result of that and so yeah for the eyes i kind of kept them I, I think i might have bulged them out a little bit but like on his they're about twice the size the lids are opened about twice the amount and the eyes bulge about yeah between two and a thousand times more um to capture that fear right so it's like the story is is more than everything and like even the the sculpting that is carved into the eye bags and things like that like i was looking at horse reference and i'm going i cannot find anything that anything that looks like what he's done but he's captured the feel of it and um and there's a lot to learn from that because you know as, as wherever you are on your artistic journey um there's always the tendency to want to chase the thing to, to make a thing look like the thing looks like if that makes sense and oftentimes we think of that as being the highest point like 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 you're doing a portrait you know can you make it look like the person that's you know that's seen as like the highest goal because it's quite a hard thing to hit but a life cast will look like the person but not have any of the person inside of it you know if if that makes sense and um and especially for this sort of stuff where you're not just just sculpting things in a in a t pose you need to you need to train that muscle like how do you how do you make it the thing and not just look like the thing well we're getting to the end of this video and so the end of this uh, demonstration on on the sculpting of the horse in general and I just I just want to talk a little bit more about the hair as we finish up because there are some problems that we have specifically in, in digital sculpture that you wouldn't have in in any other medium uh, most notably that the hair here is a separate subtool, and and you wouldn't have that in clay, you wouldn't have it in marble, and sometimes it's super obvious. So, uh, and it creates a really ugly separation because the the sentiment, the idea of those things is not that they're separate. One thing grows out of the other. So, if you have a line that chops through those, in terms of storytelling, it's very dangerous, very uh, destructive. So, if you can combine them and smudge that line a little bit, it'll help. 
Uh, what I'll probably do for this, for the presentational renders, is just do it in Photoshop and just um, smudge that line a little bit, just to just to bring those two forms together. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of you know the idea of, of studying hair being like pure design, um, it's well, so is doing anatomy, right? So like with the hair, you'll see I'm exploring with like what is the lost and found line, like through here, I, th there where the mane is reaching over. I want it to feel like there's not much going on, but there's just a bit of tension as it gets pulled over, and the rest is kind of smooth. So that's what I'm thinking, but. I'm kind of thinking about the same thing when I sculpt a muscle or a tendon, or when I'm doing something from the ground up like we did in the abstract design course. It's all the same sort of idea if you're thinking about it in the right way. 